Hello, I'm Laura Brophy. I direct the Estuary Technical Group at the Institute for Applied Ecology in Corvallis, Oregon. And I'm really happy to have a chance to talk with you today about our Pacific Northwest forested and scrub shrub tidal wetlands, also known as tidal swamps, their functions, their historical significance, and some of the past impacts and future threats to these wetlands. I'm very grateful to my co-investigators, Amy Bordy, Craig Cornu, Haida Diefenderfer, and Chris Janicek. I'll be referencing a number of studies in my talk, and you can access these by using the links that I'll provide in my final slide. Our terminology for tidal swamps isn't yet systematized. For example, forested tidal swamp is also known as tidal forest and tidal forested wetland. In the freshwater tidal zone, you may have heard of TFFW or tidal freshwater forested wetlands. And these are also known as forested riverine tidal wetlands. But the most prevalent and characteristic tidal swamps of the Pacific Northwest are dominated by brackish tolerant Sitka spruce with an understory of brackish tolerant shrubs like Pacific crabapple and black twinberry. This map shows how these tidal wetland types have been distributed historically in our estuaries. This is the historical distribution from the 1800s of tidal marsh and tidal swamp in the Nehalem River estuary of Oregon. Here in the lower estuary, you can see the bay and the tidal river exiting to the ocean. The marsh zone is found in the lower estuary, tends to have higher salinities and lower elevations, but tidal swamps are found throughout in fringing areas and particularly upstream, where the salinities are generally lower and elevations are generally higher. But you can imagine that in real life, things are not all that simple. This graph represents a huge amount of work by our teams and colleagues collecting elevation and long-term salinity data for over 40 sites throughout the Pacific Northwest. Each dot represents a sampled tidal wetland, either a forested tidal swamp, those are the blue dots, or an emergent tidal marsh, those are the orange dots. And on the y-axis, you can see the elevation of the wetland in meters relative to mean high or high water, which is shown as zero on that axis. On the x-axis, we show the dry season groundwater salinity in parts per thousand, generally the highest monthly mean from groundwater data loggers. You can see that forested wet tidal wetlands tend to cluster in the upper left part of this graph, the higher and fresher areas. But there is considerable overlap in the elevation and salinity tolerances of marsh and swamp. This circle surrounds the zone above mean higher high water and with salinities around 10 to 15 parts per thousand. Within this zone, we find both tidal swamps and tidal marshes, and this isn't a narrow transition zone. The land area that falls within this zone is actually very extensive in our estuaries. The previous graphs that I showed you used groundwater salinity rather than tidal channel salinity, and that's important because groundwater salinity tells us what's happening in the root zone, vital to both tree and shrub survival and also to carbon dynamics. The top graph on the right in this slide compares salinity between the groundwater in low marsh, high marsh, and shrub swamp to, ground, uh, to salinities within the tidal channel itself. That's the red line. And this is in a site in the Lower Columbia River estuary during the dry season months of July through September. The lower graph just shows you the tide cycle so that you can see how the groundwater salinity and the tidal channel salinity respond to these tide cycles. So this is a fairly low salinity site with channel salinities remaining in the low mesohaline and upper oligohaline throughout the dry season. Um, you can also see that salinity in the tidal channel, the red line, is higher than in the groundwater of either low marsh or high marsh or shrub swamp. And you can see the responsiveness of these low marsh and tidal channel salinity signatures to the tide cycles, not so much for the high marsh or shrub swamp. So these are the same graphs, but for the fall, during the transition from our summer dry season to our winter wet season here in the Northwest. The fall rains began at the end of October here, causing the tidal channel salinities to drop suddenly. But you can see that the low marsh salinities remained high throughout this transition to the wet season. And the same was true for the high marsh and shrub tidal swamp. They didn't drop immediately with the fall rains. So clearly groundwater salinity is somewhat uncoupled from channel salinity. Groundwater conditions are responding to inundating saline waters, but there's a strong lag and much less variability. 
To better illustrate the time lag, these graphs are from the winter when the rains are heavy on the Oregon coast. So tidal channel salinities, red here, are low, generally fresh, during this period, but they do bump up into the oligohaline during storm events. But it's striking that salinities in the low marsh remained high and did not drop into the oligohaline for four months after the onset of fall rains. And salinities in the high marsh <coughs> and the shrub tidal swamp also remained relatively high through the winter. So when we measure tidal channel salinity in tidal swamps or marshes, that's probably not very representative of the root zone. We really do need to look at groundwater. Still, channels are easier to monitor, so I recommend monitoring both so that we can better understand the relationships between these two parameters. So all of these detailed data are very interesting, but why should we care? Well, first, in most Pacific Northwest estuaries, tidal swamps historically made up a majority of our tidal wetlands. On the Oregon coast, 58% of our tidal wetlands during the 1800s were tidal swamps. In Puget Sound, two-thirds, and in the Lower Columbia, 56% of tidal wetlands as a whole were tidal swamps. That means tidal marsh made up less than half of our tidal wetlands. But nearly all of these tidal swamps have been since lost to diking and logging. On the Oregon coast, we had about 15,000 hectares of tidal wetlands in the 1800s, but we now have less than half that amount. <coughs> and nearly all the losses have been to tidal swamps. Similar losses have been documented for other parts of the Pacific Northwest, such as Reach B of the Lower Columbia River Estuary, where there's been an 82% loss of tidal forests versus about a one-third loss of other wetland types. Across the major river deltas of Puget Sound, two-thirds of historical tidal wetlands were shrub or forested, but 93% of those tidal swamps have been lost. So what have been the impacts of these swamp losses? Well, obviously the loss of ecosystem services, particularly those that are unique to tidal swamps. This NMDS analysis from Isa Wu and her colleagues in the Nisqually Estuary of Washington shows how juvenile Chinook salmon diets varied across different tidal wetland habitat types. Each dot here represents one or more sampled fish, and the circles and arrows refer to the different habitat types where the fish were captured. The diets of fish foraging in mudflats and eelgrass were similar and trended towards mycids and decapods, both crustaceans. The diets of fish foraging in salt marsh and brackish marsh tended towards amphipods, and fish foraging in tidal forests had a distinctly different diet trending towards insects, including flies and wasps. Using these data and related studies, Melanie Davis, Isa Wu, and their colleagues found that tidal forests provided higher quality food and higher modeled growth potential for young salmon compared to other estuary habitats. Another ecosystem service provided by tidal swamps is carbon sequestration. This graph from our 2020 publication shows carbon storage in tidal wetlands worldwide, and you can see that our Pacific Northwest tidal forests over here rank among the globe's highest for carbon storage, both below and above ground. Obviously, with these high functions and the nearly complete loss of our tidal swamps, we want to restore these habitats in the Northwest. And to do that, we follow the same basic steps that are used for other tidal wetlands. Choose an appropriate site, restore tidal flows and channels, and plant target vegetation, in this case, trees and shrubs, but there are some unique issues and challenges for tidal swamp restoration. These are three of the top issues we're facing, and I'll cover these in the next few slides. First, on-site changes due to past land uses mean that it's often not possible to restore tidal swamps in their historical locations. Often the loss of soil organic matter, compaction from farm operations, and drainage have caused subsidence of the wetland surface, leaving the ground surface too low for trees to survive. This cattle pasture was once a Sitka spruce tidal swamp in the 1800s, but due to diking and subsidence, it's now over a meter below mean high or high water. So we're un unlikely to be successful re restoring tidal swamp here because, as you recall, tidal swamp is almost always found above mean high or high water. So where can we restore tidal swamp? Well, we can restore it where the elevations and salinities are appropriate. Ideally, we will find a local tidal swamp reference site to build our, our planning on. 
For example, here's some forested tidal wetlands on an island in the Sayuslaw River estuary of Oregon. We can determine the elevations within that forested tidal area, and then we can find other areas at similar elevations on this island or nearby. Those might be suitable tidal rest, uh, swamp restoration sites. Of course, we're neglecting salinity in this pro approach, but within a short distance like this, only a few hundred meters, we can assume that salinity is going to be pretty similar, so we can take this shortcut by using elevation alone. However, if we don't have a local reference site for a template, we turn to reference conditions data sets like this graph that I showed you earlier. Now, there are other factors besides elevation and salinity that will influence tidal swamp establishment and persistence. I don't have time to go into them today, but finding sites that fall into this blue zone is a good start. Another challenge in tidal swamp restoration in the Northwest is invasive species, particularly reed canary grass, a very competitive grass that suppresses woody plantings. And our last presenter in this session, Fran Recht, will talk about some of the innovative methods that are currently being developed to deal with this problem. Of course, we also be, or have to be thinking about sea level rise and climate change. The future distribution of these marshes and swamps won't be the same as the historical distribution or the current distribution. Tidal swamps and marshes exist within a limited elevation range above the mudflats and tidal rivers. With sea level rise, they will probably need to migrate landward. A very important point here is that landward migration of tidal marsh often displaces the upslope tidal swamps and can lead to net loss of tidal wetlands if these tidal swamps themselves are unable to migrate, which is much more often the case due to land use barriers and uh, the time it takes to develop tidal swamps and physical topographic barriers. And the net loss of tidal wetlands. Uh, is undesirable, of course, and also we are losing the unique and valuable ecosystem services specific to tidal swamps when this. For many of our Pacific Northwest estuaries, the surrounding topography is quite steep, and this limits the landward migration potential for all tidal wetlands, as I've illustrated here for the Salmon River estuary in Oregon. These blue areas are the current extent of the estuary. With 2.5 meters of sea level rise, there's not much area remaining for tidal wetlands in this estuary due to the adjacent steep hill slopes. But there is hope because some estuaries have more migration space than others, and because restoration and conservation can help these tidal wetlands survive in place due to sediment and organic matter accretion. And finally, coastal groups are already prioritizing their actions upslope. So here are links to the publications that I've cited in my talk. And please uh, download the PDF of my talk from the conference website to use these. And if you do have or once had tidal swamps in your estuary, I hope that you will help work to bring back these fascinating and important ecosystems and their functions. Thank you very much.